Since the very first days of the internet, the US and Silicon Valley have dominated, but that could well be changing. China is a rising tech superpower, and it promises to have a profound impact upon the way the world uses the web. Welcome to Roundtable. Welcome to the program. I'm David Foster. As a country, it has more internet users than anyone else, and it wants to be a dominant tech superpower. No, nope, not the United States, China. It hopes to lead the world in advanced technologies. Silicon Valley is a home of top tech companies like Facebook, Twitter, and Google. It's easy to think of these companies as dominating the internet. Facebook has 2.41 billion users, Twitter with 330 million users, while Google receives at least 2 trillion searches per year. But a rival tech superpower has emerged, China. It is the world's biggest single social media market with 300 million users. And 802 million internet users, more than double the entire population of the United States. Chinese President Xi Jinping has long highlighted his objective for China to emerge as a cyber superpower and his vision of governing cyberspace. TikTok, a video app developed in China, has captured the hearts and minds of teenagers across the world with 1 billion users. China's emerging technology includes big data, robotics and AI. One top FBI officer has said China's goal is simple to replace the US as the world's leading superpower. And they did and will continue to break societal laws and norms to get there. In fact, we have seen an increasing level of sophistication. Innovation is happening fast in China. So should Silicon Valley be worried? And what do these shifting power dynamics of cyberspace mean for the world? OK, fascinating subject. With me at the round table, we have Winnie King, specialist in China's political economy. She'll explain what that is at Bristol University. She says the motivations of Chinese tech development are different from Silicon Valley. Julian Birkinshaw also here, professor of strategy at the London Business School, who says big US Silicon Valley-based companies look at Chinese ones with envy and some fear. Joining us from Dallas in the USA, Charity Wright, a cyber threat intelligence analyst who used to work for the US Army and the National Security Agency. I'll bring you all in in just a moment, but let, let's go to charity first of all in Dallas. And the quote that was mentioned in the build-up to this, and I'll read it again, China's goal is simple, to replace the US as the world's leading superpower. That's Amy Hess of, of the FBI. My question is, when it comes to cyber tech, charity, is it close to doing that? Absolutely. Um, you know, China has always been kind of ahead of the game uh, compared to other countries around the world when it comes to cyber threats. Um, and that's speaking from a cybersecurity standpoint. But we're seeing, um, you know, dramatic advancements in technology. I think maybe what might be crippling them is the lack of creativity and innovation, which is why we're seeing China really um, bolster their efforts for espionage and stealing proprietary data from companies around the world. But must we bracket the two things together, cyber security when it comes to national intelligence and a threat to the nation's security, and the seemingly innocent, uh, ordinary apps like TikTok, which we've already mentioned, uh, used by more than one and a half billion people worldwide. Must we put the two things together and therefore think that there is a threat with whatever it is? From my perspective, anytime I handle a technology, I'm looking at where it's manufactured and can I trust the country or the source where it's coming from. So I think it's really important for everybody to be very aware that the technology you use uh, may be used for nefarious purposes. Okay, well, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, Julian, first of all, I think you say that the TikTok is changing the rules. In, in what way? Yeah, I mean, TikTok is the first time a Chinese controlled social media company has a major presence in North America and Europe. Because obviously we've got companies like WeChat, we've got Alibaba in China, you know, with billions of users. We've got the Facebooks and the Amazons of the world, which are North American companies. We kind of understand how they work. 
for the first time now, we've got TikTok, which has a way of essentially doing what any social media company does, which is, of course, you know, to harvest lots of data about us as individuals and then potentially to use that data in ways that we don't understand. And for, for many people, that's bad when Facebook does it, but it's even worse when a Chinese company does it, for reasons okay, well, we don't well, completely are, understand. Are you not making an assumption there, that it's OK in the US and in no, the and West? No, and I'm not. But when it comes to China, oh, it, that's, that's bad. No, and in fact, I'm actually not making that assumption, and, and, and I, perhaps we're going to get into this, but for me, the dangers that we as users face with social media apps from the Facebooks of this world actually not managing that data well are as bad as, as Chinese companies do. I'm actually of the view so that So the threat that's... is the same, wherever yeah, in, in, it is. In many leverage. ways it is. Julian's mentioned information, data. Mm -hmm. Do the Chinese want this data for profit or for power? In the capitalist system that we have, profit is power, in truth. Um, so I think when we want to look at this kind of issue, just isolating a focus on China actually is not particularly helpful. Um, big thing I think that charity raises, in, in, hints at, and what Julian really raises is the whole issue of regulation. And when it comes to how we're going to manage what is, for all intents and purposes, a growing tech war between China and the United States and how we use our technology, not just with regards to protecting our national infrastructure, with regards to um, airports, with regards to telecoms, with regards to energy. It also goes to the point of using apps and mm. the use of data. So, so I mean, I, at the beginning of the program, we talked about China as a technology giant. And then I mentioned the fact that should we see um, what are supposedly harmless apps uh, bracketed with um, cybersecurity and, and hackers, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it, it, what is your feeling about that, that anything to do with technology is a danger and that China's perhaps got nefarious reasons for this, or is it simply profit, which you say, by extension, gives you power? I think what we need to consider is two separate things. Is what are China's motivations when it comes to becoming a major power in the tech sector? That's a much better question. Um, and there are two, er two ways to look at it. One has to do from a strictly national perspective, from the government's mm. perspective, and one is, has to do with um, industry, private industry. Okay. And when it comes to the motivations from the private industry, ultimately their motivations are exactly the same as any Western um, private multinational corporation. They want to grow, they want market share, they want profits. Yeah? Um, when it comes to the Chinese state, what we're talking about is how we can utilize, we being the Chinese government, how the Chinese government can utilize their, the data that's drawn from these industries and from these corporations, um, market shares, or even the, in particular technology and the patents to um, advance the Chinese economy and mm. the Chinese as a nation state. Okay, well, thank you for helping me with my clumsiness slightly there. We're, we're gonna move on now because I think we've agreed that the two things do go hand in hand mm. to some extent. But I want to get on to um, Zhuan Rongwen, Deputy Director of the Cyberspace Administration in China, says, we missed our opportunities during the Industrial Revolution. We should never lag behind in the new round of competition. So, let's go to charity. Um, this is simply China wanting to catch up, not perhaps do anything wrong? I think there's two parts to this. Um, one, yes, they want to be a world superpower. They want to reclaim their place as the quote-unquote center country. Um, the way they're going to achieve that is, is, like you guys were mentioning, both economic and there's a military side to it. There's the state side and the government's um, objectives. One of our biggest challenges is espionage efforts. Um, and, and that is to say that we know that the Chinese state is conducting widespread espionage, not only on government entities, but also in the private sector. And that is not only to advance their military technology, but also to advance um, technology that's being released in in the private sector as well. Okay. Julie. So yeah, I mean, to your question, this is China trying to catch up. I mean, it, arguably, it has caught up, and it sees the promotion of these private sector companies. This is the bit that I know the best, um, giving them every opportunity to, to succeed um, as private sector companies. And 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 as as we say, I mean, profit is the 
is the goal here. There's no question that these are listed companies that want to succeed profitably. They are also uh, looking at artificial intelligence and the next waves of technology and saying, if this is where the world is going, both as individual private companies as well as as a state, we are going to be investing massively in these things. So, you know, there are some sectors which China can never now compete in because they are, uh, those games have been lost. So there are, they are absolutely going to make sure that they don't miss this. Next yeah, there, there are a couple of US senators, probably, probably more than that, who say there should be an investigation by the Intelligence Committee into TikTok. Now, TikTok is, is, is a mobile social media app. I, my children have grown up. I, we don't have it at home, but I, you use, your yeah. children use it. So yeah. explain what it is very so, quickly. I mean, it is, it is... And then we'll discuss why it could, that could be a threat. I mean, and I don't believe it is a threat. So what is, what is TikTok? I mean, my daughter will will basically record an image of herself and then she'll put some sort of filters on it and some sort of song that she'll sync and she'll send it to her friend. So it and is it's no on a loop, isn't it? Yeah, it just goes exactly. round and round and, and, and round and round. And it's no different to WhatsApp or Snapchat or whatever. It's just a little bit trendier. Um, I think there's every chance that TikTok is sort of here today, gone tomorrow. There's absolutely no reason. Has one and a half billion users worldwide. Yeah. What but, is that? Fifth of the world's population. Yeah, no, that's more a lot like of people, quarter, pretty right? much. But 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 we absolutely know that you know that WhatsApp, Snapchat, Instagram, all of these apps have kind of they, they go through massive phases of popularity. Mm. You know, gradually the kids' parents and then the kids' grandparents start using them, and the kids <laughs> hop onto the next thing. Okay, so, so must we be suspicious first of all, or not? If we are talking from the position of America, which has dominated the tech sector and um, tech patents, tech market share, then yes. The reason I say this is because the key thing that the Americans should be concerned about, if we're talking from that perspective, is that China's interest with regards to something like TikTok and its apps and promoting its um, tech presence around the world, is its focus is not North America and Europe. It definitely wants to get into these sectors because they are the most lucrative, but the emerging markets around the world are consumer-based, population-based, mm. have more potential. You have a lot of barriers to which that exist that will stop ch the Chinese from entering into the Western markets, such as the fact that, like you said, Silicon Valley is decades ahead of the Chinese in terms of their potential for growth, and the Chinese are in catch-up mode. There are sectors where the Chinese have caught up and potentially surpassing. But in the emerging economies, they but, do but not then, have... Let me just stop you yeah. just for a second. That is partly because all of the R&D has gone into Silicon Valley, exactly. whereas in China, we are led to believe that an awful lot of the information or the means to do it has been stolen, and therefore you can catch up that much more quickly. So the, the initial R&D investment that went into Silicon Valley was yeah. actually from the state. Yeah, it was from the American government. The same way for the Chinese, the initial mm. investments in venture capital that went into the tech sector is from the Chinese government. This is China's development and how it's grown in the tech sector is not new. Mm. And what the Chinese have done is they've just adapted it for their context and their political system. Okay. Do, you, do you think it's the American companies just squealing, it's protectionism? So, so there is a bit of that because obviously what happened was WeChat, which is owned by Tencent, and Alibaba, these, took are both off. Chinese These are the two big Chinese yeah. social media companies, if you like, before TikTok. Um, they were allowed to take shape because China prevented Google and Facebook from entering China in the early 2000s. Now, that, that gave these companies space to take off. Those companies have caught up very quickly. They now have technology which is as good as Facebook, Google, and Amazon's. And now, arguably, they are as well positioned to move, say, into emerging markets as the American. I suppose companies. what I'm wondering is, is it corporate jealousy? So, so there's a little bit of, you know, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook has been explicit in saying he wants Facebook to be more like WeChat. He actually looks at WeChat's power over the, sort of the whole value chain of things that they do with a bit of jealousy, because he sees that Facebook's They would want only... us to be slightly frightened of the Chinese in that case, <laughs> wouldn't they? Yeah, so the Americans would, you mean? Yes. Or, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. And, and there's a little bit of that going on. I absolutely believe that. OK. Uh, Charity, let's talk about something called Cloud Hopper. We're talking about industrial espionage, but on, on a cyber scale here. Uh, November 2017, US charges three Chinese hackers with targeting US corporations for commercial advantage. Uh, a, a year later, the same thing, but the name attached to it then is Operation Cloud 
Hopper. How much of that is happening? We're talking about, the, you know, stealing secrets, et cetera, et cetera. But how much of that goes on? Oh, it's going on constantly. There's a national concerted effort um, to expand, you know, China's interests around the world. And what we're seeing is just a constant espionage effort. Now, Cloud Hopper was unique because it was such a large scale operation that was going on for years. Um, what was happening is a Chinese state sponsored cyber operation, which we call APT 10, um, were discovered in cloud hosting companies' networks. So they're hosting data for hundreds or thousands of companies. And what happened is the group got access to this network and then used that network to pivot into the customer's networks. So um, We're talking about big companies like IBM, Ericsson, Fujitsu, Tata Consulting, Hewlett, Packard, Enterprise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Massive corporations. Absolutely with access to tons of very valuable information um, that the Chinese state wanted to get their hands on. And unfortunately, they were um, in these networks undetected for years before this was finally discovered. And have they, um, has anything happened to these individuals, to the investigation? Because I, I read the headlines about they're indicted, but I guess these people are back in China and China's not going to put them up uh, for interrogation. Uh I can't confirm what resulted as, as a result of that, but um, for sure the indictments happened. Okay, but and there have been several other instances where Chinese individuals have been indicted for hacking operations. I mean, the one thing I will add is that, you know, I've talked at length to the, the senior Chinese, Chinese people in, in WeChat, which of course is this you know, billion plus user um, app. Um, and of course they, they will tell me that they are a completely independent private company with no no links to the Chinese state. And but aren't they also bound by Chinese so, law well, to, to the, report anything? So they are bound by Chinese law. Of course and, and they I guess, say that. And, uh, no, exactly. I mean, my, my point is we in the West will never get to the bottom of the nature of that relationship. I mean, it's a listed company. They have obligations to their shareholders. They also have obligations to the Chinese government that I will never understand. Um, I do think it's important to separate out the story you just talked about, which is very sensitive information from information of a social media variety, which I don't believe the Chinese government... Well, I, really I, su I suppose what I'm trying to get at is... Um, this was the former Australian National Cyber Security Advisor. You may know Alistair McGibbon. This, Operation Cloudhopper, was the theft of industrial or commercial secrets for the purpose of, of advancing an economy, the lifeblood of a company. Sure, one understands that, but is this... This is what I'm really trying yeah. to get at, and each one of you take your turn on this one. Is such a, something such as WeChat, TikTok, etc., uh. is it a Trojan horse for Chinese uh, political interests and national security interests it can to be. infiltrate? It can be. It's not necessarily, we can't say for sure that is what they were purposed for. Um, obviously, they were purposed for social media and bringing people together and providing a domestic alternative to uh, Western apps like Facebook. But that's not to say that it's not being used to collect data on people around the world. And you're a bit worried about this because I think you monitor what your children do with TikTok, Charity. Absolutely. And I do want to follow up on a comment earlier. I don't believe it's impossible for us to get to the bottom of this. Being that I worked in the National Security Agency, there is a lot of very good intelligence coming out through that agency that we on the outside now will not be exposed to. And what they do know leads to indictments. Um, and what they don't know, they're trying to fill in those intelligence gaps every day. Uh, we work with our, our allied intelligence agencies as well. Um, and together, we're doing a lot more intelligence sharing these days. And bringing together all of the information from around the world is really helping us to catch these, these threats, state-sponsored. So what, what do you do to level? check that your children aren't leaking information that uh, could be damaging either to you as a family or perhaps to national security uh, when they're using this app, TikTok? I mean, what, what can you do? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. I was really, really hesitant to allow my children access to this app. Um, but when I started researching, it really comes down to this. We live in a world with technology and we're going to use it, but we have to use it wisely. And that means being cautious. It doesn't necessarily mean you need to never use any foreign technology. It just means uh, 
use common sense. So I make sure our apps are updated. Um, anytime there's a security vulnerability, like the one that was just published today um, in the news, make sure your apps are um, updated so they're protected against those vulnerabilities. I also monitor my children's use of the app, which I think is really important for parents to understand. And, and would you do the same with a, with a Western developed one? Absolutely. I do that with any apps that my children use. Uh, I, look I, at I guess you've got, not got a lot of spare time after doing, doing all, all of that. Uh, I think what um, Charity wrote to us was she said she's concerned but not freaking. <laughs> Um, I, I would agree with that. I think I think there's there's a bit of a naivete to think that the Chinese are the only ones engaging in corporate espionage and this kind of um, cyber attacks. Okay, I, I think you will when we look into it, the Russians, the Americans, I bet you anything, the Canadians as well will be engaging in this kind of behavior. Moving to this same point is that we've got the same problems with 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 Facebook in particular, which is that, you know, we uh, need to regulate this sphere much more effectively in terms of... But if somebody's coming in under the cover of darkness, effectively, and saying they're doing something else when they get to the checkpoint, then no amount of regulation for a foreign company is, is going to have any effect in a different jurisdiction. But, but what, data, what data are we talking about there? I, I'm not sure I understand that point. So what, what, what data are we worried about shall we say, being used for nefarious means. I mean, I, if I look at the way that these social media apps are being used, you know, what is happening is essentially our personal information is being harvested to essentially allow those companies to make more money. Uh, and that is absolutely the, the objective of both American and Chinese companies in this space. Uh, That's I'm, what I think okay. needs to be regulated. I, I'm not a great alarmist and I'm not a great tech person when it comes to this, but I do read the stories that say that once you are into... Uh, somebody's personal information, then it's quite easy to find a way into other systems, and therefore you could you could hack something that is vulnerable. I'm so, I'm sorry that sounds so, so incredibly I think, and, and I moralistic, think... but I have to ask um, Charity about that one. Is that yes, a concern? Absolutely, absolutely. Every day on my job, I'm in the deep and dark web monitoring what hackers are doing, and a lot of it revolves around personal data. Essentially, information is the most valuable asset in the world today. So whatever they can get their hands on, they will. And that will, goes will they for get to a point? Low-level hackers and state level. They is a big generalization again. It doesn't matter whether it's China or a sophisticated group from somewhere else. Will they get to a point? Do you think charity? And then they, either of you can say whatever you want. Where they can shut down a country? I mean, that's a, that's a big stretch. I think we're not there yet. I think the there is some capabilities around the world, but really the threat comes down to the capability of the enemy and your vulnerabilities to that enemy. And I think that right now, most of the high-level state actors, Russia, China, the US, are prepared to defend against that kind of attack. And if China gets to its stated goal of uh, being the dominant force in all of this by 2050, what will it mean to the rest of us? Something serious or something not at all? A lot of it really ultimately depends on what China's motivations are. I think going to your original question in terms of w whether or not if something happened, you could shut down the country. I agree with Charity, it, but it all depends on what areas you are willing to expose your infrastructure to. Example, I've done research on Hinkley Point, the very power fact- Power station. The power station, the, yeah. nu the new nuclear power station. The fact that the Chinese are going to be involved in the building and the running of the nuclear power, power station, and potentially, should we move forward with Bradwell and Speed Speedwell, which are two additional power nuclear power stations, with the Chinese will be involved in actually building and running? Yes, you could, because all you have to do is find that one linchpin, that one tipping point where you just say, "I'm going to hit that," and you will cut down, sorry, shut down the entire energy grid. That's big. Yeah, and you, you could, expose you, your you telecoms. Could shut down, no energy, you've got no hospitals because you need the power, even if there are backup generators. This is effectively yeah, what, exactly. what I meant. And, and, and I'm not saying Cripple, that the Chinese. Not shut down. I'm not saying that the Chinese should will be doing that. I'm not saying what I'm saying is that any government should be cognizant of the fact that there are certain areas which of nuclear mm. security, oh, sorry, of national security, which should and always should be 
of national security. Have we just invented? So I've got to do this yeah. quickly. Have we just invented another bogeyman? 35, 40 yeah, years ago, so. it was the Soviet Union. Yeah, and we went through a phase of the Chinese, of the Japanese being the bogeyman exactly. as well. So, yeah. yeah, I do worry. I really do think that 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 we are overstating this problem. And I'm sure Charity is going to disagree with me on this. But you know, what does China want? It wants to be a superpower. It wants to have a high and rising standard of living for its people, and it wants super competitive companies. And what it wants is to get these companies to become global leaders. And one of the ways to do that is actually to, to liberate them, to allow them to, to take off on their own, which doesn't, in fact, mean manipulating them behind the scenes. OK, quick final word from you, Charity. When you go to work tomorrow, uh, will you be looking at China as the biggest threat, or could it, in fact, be anybody? China and Russia are up there with the top threats to the US, but it depends on where you are, what country you live in. Um, you know, every adversary has a specific target. So for the U.S., yes, China and Russia are at the top. Iran right now is in the news. is definitely, um, you know, a second-tier adversary. Not much to worry about, then. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Winnie, thank you for coming in. Julian, we appreciate your time and charity. Um, good luck with whatever you find out at work tomorrow. Perhaps if it's not too secret, you'll come back and tell us. Yes, sir. Thank you. OK, listen, thank you very much for watching. It's been a, a fascinating discussion. And uh, uh, we'll be back with more on Roundtable. For me, David Foster and the team, we hope to have your company next time. Goodbye for now.